I will start with a broad overview of the field of aging research. Um, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with it already, uh, but I'll also tell you some of my own personal views um, about the field and how, how it's going. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about different projects we've been working on. So one of the advantages of working on aging is that it's, it's a process pretty much everyone is familiar with, um, but I thought I would show you what is aging in this Czech centenarians, which I think is quite striking. Now, of course, there's more to aging than meets the eye. Um, there's a number of changes with age at different biological levels, cellular, molecular, physiological, functional. Um, so I, I tend to define aging, I, I like the definition that aging is a progressive deterioration of physiological function accompanied by an increase in vulnerability and mortality with age. And as I'm sure you were aware, aging is an increasingly growing problem uh, for society, for medicine, um, because there's this graying, this aging of the population in the US, in the UK, in Europe, um, in that the percentage of elderly individuals is gradually increasing. And this, this is a major challenge, really, um, because as I'm sure you're aware, age is a risk factor for most life-threatening human diseases. And the major killers now of modern society are age-related diseases. Um, so about nearly three quarters of people in this room will die of an age-related disease of cancer, heart disease, heart and cardiovascular diseases, and neurodegenerative diseases. So these are the major killers. And because of the aging of the population, the incidence of these diseases is gradually increasing. So it is a challenge. It's a biomedical challenge. Um, but it is also... It also opens an opportunity in the sense that if we could manipulate the process of aging, if we could even slightly retard the process of aging, this would have unprecedented medical benefits because it would affect a multitude of age-related diseases. Now, of course, that's not easy because, first of all, aging is a complex process. I mean, this is a um, one from John Ferber. Um, I mean, the details are not important. These are different players or different uh, components uh, and pathways uh, associated with aging and how they interact. And it's actually not the full model. I only could fit in half of it in the slide. Uh, the point about this is that um, aging is complex in the sense that it involves multiple players, multiple components and their interactions. Now, I don't think, so I think aging is complex, but I don't think it's unsurmountably complex. I think, first of all, there's more complex processes. I think development is more complex than aging. Um, I think the human mind is more complex than aging. Uh, how we think, how, how can we think, uh, is more complex. Um, so I don't think aging is the most complex of all. And I think it's solvable uh, in the sense that there is a finite number of components associated with aging. Um, so in theory, we can fully understand aging, even though we are still quite far from it. In fact, aging remains a mystery of biology in the sense that we still don't know what are the precise molecular mechanisms that drive aging. Um, there's a number of theories that I'm sure you're aware of, the free radical theory of aging, the DNA damage theory of aging, etc. Um, but we still don't know for sure uh, whether these are right or wrong, um, whether these putative mechanisms of aging are correct or incorrect, and what really are the molecular mechanisms that drive aging. On the other hand, there are some reasons to be optimistic that we can manipulate aging in human beings. Um, one aspect of aging that I've always been fascinated about are species that appear not to age, or what, what Tuck Finch coined as species with negligible senescence. Um, and as you can see in these examples here, we're, we're talking about complex animals. We're not talking about amoebas or unicellular organisms. We're talking about complex vertebrate animals, like certain species of fishes, uh, certain turtles. Um, there's also some salamanders that appear not to age. What, what I mean by appear not to age is they do not exhibit the physiological functional decline, or at least we cannot observe it, um, that you would observe, for instance, in pretty much every single mammal, um, and that you observe in humans and, and, and other species. Um, these species are also unlike human beings, and unlike all known um, mammals, they also don't exhibit the, the, the exponential increase in mortality with age. So, for example, so in human beings, once you reach the age of 30, your chances of dying double roughly every eight years. Uh, and in mice, it's, it's much, much quicker. Um, but so, some studies 
uh, looking at mortality of these species in the wild, for example, turtles, they fail to, to find evidence that, um, that mortality is increased with age. And in a few cases, not all of them, there's also an increased reproductive output with age. So, for example, in some fishes, some fishes grow throughout their lives. So the older they are, the bigger they are, the more eggs they can lay, um, which you can think evolutionary, then it makes sense for these organisms not to age. Um, though that's, that actually does, that doesn't happen in every single case. So, so the point is that, no, of course, the argument is always that, I mean, nobody has studied these animals for 500 years, so we don't know for sure maybe they will eventually age. But at the very least, they age much slower than human beings. So evolution can construct animals that live much longer than human beings and age much slower. The other reason to be optimistic, um, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is the, the surprising fact that aging is uh, a very plastic process, at least in model organisms, in the sense that it can be manipulated by genes and by environment, like diet. So, um, so age one, uh, which was the, the first single allele uh, significantly affecting lifespan, so that was identified by Tom Johnson and colleagues over 20 years ago in, um, in the rindworm C. elegans. Um, and so that was the first one, but we now know of dozens of genes that individually manipulated have a tremendous impact on longevity and aging. So I think the current record, um, I think it's a, also a, an age one allele, uh, which is a single age one allele that extends lifespan by tenfold. Uh, so that would be like humans living over a thousand years. Now, of course, we mammals are more complex. And so even though there's a number of genes um, associated with aging in, uh, in uh, mice, um, I think the current record for mice, I believe it's the growth hormone receptor knockout. Uh, so again, it's a single gene disruption, just disrupting the growth hormone receptor, which I believe extends lifespan by up to 50%, uh, which is still quite remarkable if you think that could be applied to humans. There'll still be humans living over 150 years. Um, but, and one important point is that, so these manipulations, in mice in particular, um, they're not just extending lifespan. They are retarding the aging process. So it's not just, uh, so it's extending health as well. It's preserving health. So it's a single gene mutation that manipulates the whole aging process. So the incidence of multiple diseases is retarded, uh, and physiological aging is retarded as well. Uh, so it's, it's a very um, dramatic impact that it has. It's not just extending lifespan. It's retarding the process of aging as a whole. Um, now, of course, the obvious question is whether these genes have any relevance to humans. Um, and there is some evidence that they do. I mean, there's genes associated with human longevity. Um, and I mean, I'll show you two examples. Um, one of them, as you can see here, is uh, Werner's syndrome which is a putative case of accelerated aging, or so-called segmental prodroid syndromes. Um, and, I mean, as you can see, these this patients do appear to age faster. Um, the incidence of, and the, so a number of age-related diseases have an earlier onset in this, um, in this patient, and also a number of physiological changes. It's not a perfect phenocopy of aging, so it's not everything you observe in normal aging, you observe at an early aging this individual in these patients, um, but it's still very significant, um, in particular because uh, this disease, Werner's syndrome, derives from a mutation in a single gene, which is the Werner's syndrome gene. So again, a mutation of a single gene um, does cause at least that multiple processes associated with normal aging be accelerated. Um, on the other hand of the spectrum, we have some cases of it may be delayed human aging. Um, it's obviously very difficult to study this in humans because of our lifespan. Um, but I'll show you one example. This is a relatively recent study from Walter Longo's lab and Jaime um, Guevara uh, Aguirre. Um, so that, that's the doctor there in the middle. And then, as you can see, his cohort is, is uh, they're studying uh, little people. And I think this is a study in Ecuador. And the reason these are little people is because they have a deficiency in the growth hormone receptor. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Knocking out the growth hormone receptor in mice significantly extends lifespan. So they were interested in studying these individuals with growth hormone receptor deficiency, seeing whether they would exhibit any alterations in the aging process. Now, what they found, what the least most striking observation, was that these individuals do not appear to die of cancer. I mean, the sample size is not that big. I mean, we're talking about 30 individuals there. Uh, but none of the individuals with growth hormone deficiency um, died of cancer. 
as compared to relatives uh, without the growth hormone receptor deficiency, in which little over 20% of them died of cancer, which is what you expect. Little over 20% of people in this room will die of cancer. Um, now, well, that, that was, I thought that was striking and very interesting observation. I should say that the overall mortality and longevity of these individuals with growth hormone receptor deficiency was not different from their relatives. So they appear to have a higher incidence of some diseases. Um, I believe heart disease is one of them. Um, so there may be some trade-offs. But the important point is that a human um, mutation in a gene associated with longevity and aging in, model, in, in a model organism can have an impact, um, a striking impact, um, in at least one age-related disease. So, um, the, so the take-home message that so aging is not just a collection of age-related diseases running in parallel. There is a process of aging. It is possible to manipulate this process of aging to a very, to a surprisingly large degree in model organisms. Um, and in humans, maybe we can manipulate genes by diet, by lifestyle, maybe even by drugs. Uh, they will have an impact on aging and allow us to manipulate human aging, which would have a, a dramatic impact um, on human health span um, and on society, really. And, and, and so, really, by my, the goal of my career really is to try to develop interventions that manipulate the aging process, the human aging process. So that, that's, that's really the goal. And it's, it's not easy. I mean, there are certainly diseases that are much easier to, to tackle than aging. Um, but that is the ultimate goal of what we're trying to do. Um, and really, as a side note, um, I came across this book. I think so. This is a book. I think it was written by an Australian nurse, um, and it's it's about the top regrets of people who are about to die. Um, so she went into people on their deathbeds and says, "Well, what do you regret most in your life?" And the top one regret was not following one's dreams for, you know, for convenience, for practical reasons. Um, that, that was the number one regret. So at least I will not have that regret. At least, I, at least I'm trying to, to achieve my dream of, of um, manipulating, tackling the, the process of aging. And if you're curious about the other regrets, um, here they are. So, so what, what do we do in our lab? Um, actually, we do quite a lot of things. I think. To understand aging, I, th I think it's important to have a broad perspective and to bring different elements and different um, approaches. So we do a mixture of bioinformatics and, and computational approaches. Um, we also do evolutionary studies, and we do some experiments as well, typically cell molecular biology. Um, so what, I, what I'll do here today is I'll, I'll tell you about some of the projects that we've been working on. Um, I won't go into a huge amount of methodological detail, um, so my, my aim is to give more of broad overview of, of everything we do, of the single, different aspects of our work. Um, but of course, if you're interested in more details about the methods involved, um, I'd be happy to discuss them. So, one, I guess one aspect of aging that has always fascinated me is this impact of individual genes on aging in, in model organisms, how genes can regulate the process of aging. Um, and really, I mean, if you think about the genome, the genome is a it's huge, we're talking um, three gigabytes of data, um, and a very tiny part of it can have a dramatic impact on aging. So one of the goals of our lab is to try to decipher how the genome regulates longevity, aging, uh, really help decipher the human genome. And I think this is also important for my ultimate goal of really tackling the process of aging and helping develop interventions. I do think we, we need to have a better understanding of life and of the genome um, in order to develop interventions on aging. Um, because it is still fairly incomplete. I mean, nearly half of the 20,000 human genes um, have been fairly poorly studied. Um, and there's all these levels of genome regulation that we're discovering, from microRNAs to RNA editing, epigenetics, etc. cetera. Um, and this is exemplified. Uh, one example I usually give is the, that the rate of success of drugs in clinical trials is only about 20%. Um, which I think is very low, because if you think a drug in a clinical trial, it already ha must have a lot of data already, a lot of information, a lot of preclinical data. And still, in 80% of the cases, it's going to fail, um, because it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, or it has side effects. Um, and so with this in mind, I think, I think we need a better understanding of the, of the machines of life um, to make 
predictions more accurately and, and to develop better interventions uh, for aging, for age-related diseases, etc. So, one project that I started already as a PhD student was really focused on um, these genes that were really a catalog, a database of genes associated with aging, um, which I, I call GeneH, um, Database of Aging-Related Genes. So I started, as I said, I started as a PhD student just because I was fascinated by the capacity of individual genes to impact on aging. And I just started cataloging them and I thought, well, I'll put a good database so, you know, so other people can use them, so hopefully other people can be interested in this. Um, and I mean, so this is online and, and so we've been working on this for several years, but I'll just, the latest update that we, we published recently, actually, we have over 1,500 uh, genes associated with aging or longevity in model organisms, uh, mostly C. elegans uh, and yeast, I believe, um, but also nearly 100 genes in mice. So that's so we're talking about hundreds. There's now hundreds of individual genes that, when manipulated, um, disruption, knockout, silencing in model organisms have a significant impact on aging or longevity, which I think it's it's remarkable, and I don't think people expected this 20 years ago. Um, and then we also derived a list of what he called candidate human aging related genes, which are essentially some of the best candidates from model organisms, some of the genes associated with aging in humans, like the Werner syndrome gene, uh, which are about, well, I think there's nearly 300 now. Um, and the, the point about gene age was that, so I started this just because I was curious about it, just because I, I wanted to learn more about these genes, and I thought the database was a good way of cataloging information. Um, but it's really a tool now. It's, it's really a resource for functional genomics and systems biology. I mean, we know that genes don't work individual. They interact with each other and with the environment to derive and to impact on aging and, and longevity. Um, so it's really a tool. Um, and I mean, a lot of people use GeneH to, to analyze gene expression data. If you do a gene expression experiment, you can. Um, then look at genes that are in GeneH, maybe give you some insights genome-wide association studies, um, interactions between genes, etc. Uh, and so it, it's been a widely used resource. Um, I mean, the numbers there, over 20, 20 stations and 200,000 visitors per year, that's actually for the whole website. So, so we have other databases and other tools. So it's GeneH. Uh, we have a database of animal longevity records. So it, it's all of our tools together. Um, we do have quite a lot of citations and visitors. And as I said, we just published an update um, on, on our tools. Um, but really, what we want is to try to look at this genetic regulation of aging as a whole, so how the individual components interact uh, to understand the whole from its parts. Um, and I'll show you one example of what we've been doing. I mean, other people have been using GeneH to do very exciting things. But I'll just show you one example of a project we were recently involved in, um, which employs a, an old method. Called, uh, so if you have a network, so this is a network. Um, where in gray you have proteins associated with aging, that is, um, proteins in gene age, uh, and in white you have proteins that have not been studied yet in context of aging. Uh, and you can get protein-protein interaction data from public databases, and you can build a network like this one, which is actually very simplified. Um, and the argument, and, and this has been employed in a number of other diseases and, and processes, but the argument is that proteins, like the two in the middle, that interact with a number of proteins in turn associated with aging, they're more likely to themselves be involved in aging. Um, so I actually did this approach when I was a PhD student, um, but I did it for human proteins, and so there was no way of testing it. Um, but more recently, and with um, Vadim Freifeld in Israel and, and Gary Rufkin in Boston, um, we did a similar approach, um, and we tested some of, well, to be honest, the, the lab in Boston, so Gary Rufkin and Sean Curran in particular, they tested um, the computational predictions. So again, what you see here is a network. So in green, um, we have proteins that are in gene age, and in light green, we have proteins that are not in gene age, but interact with proteins in gene age. So basically what they did was they tested all of the proteins that interact with proteins in gene age for lifespan effects in C. elegans using RNAi. Um, and what they found was a very strong enrichment in longevity genes. So of the f about 400 genes, candidate genes that they tested, um, they found 13 times more uh, genes associated that had an impact on lifespan than expected by chance. And, and in particular, genes extending lifespan. 
Uh, so these are not just genes that you silence that and reduces lifespan, but you could say, well, maybe that's just causing some disease. No, these were mostly genes extending lifespan, which makes sense because most of the genes in gene age are genes extending lifespan as well. So that, that was actually quite reassuring. So what it shows really is that we can use these network-based approaches to derive um, insights, and in this particular case, to identify rank candidates for, for experimental studies. And I'll show you in a little bit um, a similar approach. Now, um, another aspect that we're interested in really is, is broader aspects of functional genomics, and in particular taking advantage of existing data. Um, so I think what you see here are, so I, pre, I think this is data from GEO, Gene Expression Omnibus, which is essentially microarray data or gene expression data. Um, and as you can see, there's a massive amount of data being generated by labs worldwide. Um, and we're trying to take advantage of this to gain functional insights on, on, um, on genes. So one of the things that we did, which, again, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of details because we just published it in BMC Genomics. Um, but basically, uh, and this was mostly the work of Sipko Van Dam, who's a PhD student in our lab. For all microarray data, that uh, pass certain quality filters. Um, we built a co-expression map of all genes, uh, so a matrix. So essentially we have a matrix, say, for human genes. You have 20,000 genes by 20,000 genes. Um, and you look at how strongly they're co-expressed with each other. Um, so co-expression being whether, so if one of them goes, is over-expressed in experiment, what's the chances of the other also being co-expressed and, and so on. So. Um, the rationale being that if, if genes tend to be co-expressed, if they tend to go up or down in, um, across different experimental conditions, that more likely to be functionally related, um, more likely to be associated with similar transcriptional modules. Um, so we built this matrix, and then the idea was that we can use this information, first of all, to identify and rank, again, genes for experiments, um, using a similar guilt by association method as the ones employing networks. Again, the idea is that if you have a group of genes associated, say, with aging, um, and there's one gene that's not on that group that is co-expressed with a lot of them, um, or at least more than expected by chance, then this gene is a candidate itself for being associated with the process and the study, in this case, aging. Um, so essentially, and so this is now online, we call it Gene France, and it's um, it's available online, so I certainly uh, invite you to try it out. Um, so essentially, if you have a seed list of genes associated with a process or disease, you can put it in. It will give you the genes that are co-expressed with it. and will give you p-values of how strongly they are associated as well. Um, the other thing I thought was useful about was, as I said earlier on, there's a lot of genes that we don't know their function. Um, that's been very poorly studied. Uh, but again, if you know which genes they tend to be co-expressed with, this may give you some insights into their function. Um, so we found some genes that are co-expressed with mitochondrial genes, very strongly co-expressed with mitochondrial genes that are likely, or they're more likely, to be themselves uh, have some role in mitochondria, for example. So really, this tool is useful for these two purposes in particular. Now, we did try it, so we developed this tool. Um, but then, of course, we also wanted to try it. So we tried it with aging-related genes from gene age, etc. Um, the most interesting results actually came from cancer-related genes. So when we put in a group of cancer-related genes, we found a few um, genes that have not been studied at all that were strongly co-expressed with cancer-related genes. Uh, in particular, a gene called BC055324, um, which is strongly co-expressed with genes associated with the cell cycle and the DNA damage responses, which had not been studied at all. Um, so we tested it experimentally. So essentially we use RNAi in uh, HeLa cells, which are a human cancer cell line, uh, to silence the gene. So what you see in this plot is, so we have a positive control, which is basically an RNAi that is going to induce cell death. Um, we have a negative control, and we have our um, RNAi targeting the human homologue of the BC gene. So the BC gene was actually initially identified as additionally a mouse gene, and uh, C1 or uh, 112 is the human homologue. So when you silence the, the human homologue, um, it reduces cell proliferation. Now, that doesn't tell us much about the function, but it tells us that the gene is functional, so it is doing something. Um, so what we're trying to do now is we're trying to look into the 
function of the gene. I mean, based on its co-expression patterns, we suspect it's related to cell cycle regulation, possibly under DNA damage, um, but we're not sure. So that's something we're studying now. Um, we also found out that um, as part of large-scale knockout um, consortium of, in mice, um, there, were, there is a knockout, or well, they did try to create a knockout mice of the gene, um, and these are not viable. So again, the gene does have a function. Um, and so now we're generating conditional knockout mice um, that we can further study. I mean, I say we are generating. Uh, there's actually no two of I mean, So these are being generated at MRC Harwell uh, by um, our collaborator, Paul Potter, um, who will then ship them to us uh, for us to study. Okay, so the other topic, I mean, I mean I've mean, i talked about, uh, talked a lot about genetics and genetic regulation of aging and genes associated with aging. I guess the other element, I mean, the other important modulator of aging is the environment and diet in particular. Um, and we've been having some focus on diet, uh, and in particular with the most widely studied uh, dietary manipulation of aging, which is caloric restriction, um, which I'm so sure some of you are familiar with. So, but just as a reminder, so caloric restriction was identified by Clyde McCain and colleagues at Cornell um, following some earlier findings. And what they observed is that, so typically in the lab, um, mice are fed a libitum. That is, they can eat how much they want. Um, and what they, he discovered was that if you reduce the amount of calories, uh, but you keep other nutrients, uh, vitamins healthy, um, it has, it extends, significantly extends lifespan. Um, and this is what you see here in this plot. Um, I think that's data from um, from San Antonio in rats. Um, as you can see, you have the alivitum group and you have the caloric restricted group. Um, and there is a striking impact on lifespan. So caloric restriction significant, living up to 50% extends lifespan in in mice and rats. Um, and again, it's not just it's not just extending lifespan; it's it's retarding the process of aging. Um, Though, I mean, I guess effects vary between strains, but at least in some strains, it, it is retarding the process of aging. Um, and I mean, if I can just summarize 50 years of research on caloric restriction in, in a single slide, I would say it extends lifespan in most, but not all species. Um, so it extends lifespan in the traditional biomedical model organisms, the elegance mice, rats, um, fruit flies, yeast. Um, but there are a few exceptions. There are some species in which it doesn't appear to extend lifespan. Um, it does have some negative side effects, um, maybe detrimental for fighting infections. Um, its mechanisms are still, I guess, under debate. I mean, I, I do think hormonal alterations are important, um, but there's also some, there must be some sort of signaling cascade, which we do not fully understand. I mean, we know some of the players, but not all of them. Um, there's been more recent studies of caloric restriction in rhesus monkeys. There's, there's two studies, one at the NIA, in the US, the other in Wisconsin, also in the US, I guess. Um, and they have some conflicting results. I mean, Wisconsin study essentially found that caloric restriction does reduce overall mortality, um, but not the NIA study. Uh, this is, my interpretation is that this has to do with the controls. Essentially, the controls of the NIA studies are fed a healthier diet. Um, and so you don't observe an effect from caloric restriction. Though, in mortality. Do you do observe, for example, I think both studies observe that caloric restriction reduced the incidence of neoplasia. So in terms of certain health parameters and some age related diseases, both studies are in agreement that caloric restriction has benefits. Now, with that in mind, I, I certainly don't think that caloric restriction is likely to be effective in humans. I don't think the, the massive in, increase in lifespan, for example, they observe in mice and rats, at least in some strains, um, is applicable to humans of caloric restriction. Um, but first of all, I think it is a very good model to study mechanisms of aging um, because you have two groups of animals with different lifespans and different rates of aging. Um, and it could also be useful to identify drug targets. So we know, for example, that rapamycin, um, which extends lifespan in mice, um, significantly extends lifespan in mice, and we know the example of resveratrol that at least in some conditions, extends lifespan in mice, though so not normal mice, it appears. Um, we have these two examples that, of drugs that may function via caloric restriction-related pathways um, that may have health benefits. Um, and it, so the idea, I mean, I certainly don't recommend caloric restriction to anybody. 
Um, and, and the point made by, by Woody Allen is really that maybe we can develop lifestyles or, or, or even drugs and treatments that allow us to have the benefits of caloric restriction without having to go to, on a caloric restriction-related diet. Um, and what you see here on the right, so that's, that's, well, that's from a recent paper of ours and what we think are the most important players in caloric restriction. And I do think hormonal changes like growth hormone, insulin, IGF-1 are important, uh, but then for sure there's a signaling cascade. And this is, there's not all players that I think are important there, they're just the most important ones. The signaling cascade um, that for sure uh, is important in the benefits of caloric restriction, uh, which we are trying to understand. Um, so what we've been doing really is, is okay, so one, one of the things we've been focusing on, with this in mind of trying to identify important genes in the mechanism of regulation of caloric restriction is we've been focused on what we call caloric restriction essential genes. So normally, um, in most model systems, um, if you take an animal and put it in a caloric restriction diet, it extends lifespan. But there's a variety of mutants in which this doesn't happen. So if you put a mutant animal and, a, and certain strains as well under dietary restriction, and it doesn't have an effect on lifespan. So what we did was, so we define such mutants or such genes as caloric restriction essential genes. So are genes that if genetically altered, against knocking out, disruption, silencing, this cancel out the life extending effects of caloric restriction. Um, so SER2 would be, in East, would be an example. As a gene that if you knock out, it disrupts the caloric restriction uh, life extending effects. Um, so what we did was really the first systematic analysis of these genes. Um, I mean, a lot of people have focused on them before individually, but to my surprise, nobody had really focused on them on a systematic way. So we looked at the literature, we found over 100 genes uh, in traditional model organisms, typically yeast and worms. Um, and our rationale again is because caloric restriction induces a number of changes, if we can focus on genes that are crucial for its life extending effects, um, this may be able us to focus on which specific processes and which specific genes are important for its impact on aging, the impact of caloric restriction on aging. Uh, and this may be better suited, such nodes may be better suited for drug targets, as drug targets, for instance. Um, so we systematically um, searched for these genes. Um, then we made a database out of them. I mean, this is available. Uh, we call it GeneDR. Um, dietary restriction is a bit broader than caloric restriction, so um, it has about 150 genes at the moment, I think, so um, again, you're welcome to use it. I mean, uh, my policy is always to, to share the data, and uh, uh, I mean, I would like as many people as possible to study aging and to study its manipulation and to study its genetics, so I think it's important to give the data out there and encourage as many people as possible to, to also study um, that, in this case, caloric restriction. Um, so we made a database, and then we made a, a number of system biology slash network analysis. Again, trying to understand the interactions between the genes, um, and also integrating other types of data. So you can overlay gene expression data on your networks uh, to try to find which nodes are more important, uh, to try to find which which are regulating which genes are regulating which. Um, I won't show you all of our results. Um, I'll just show you one aspect. Um, so we use the same network-based um, guilt by association method to uh, derive new uh, genes associated with caloric restriction, which we then tested in East. Um, or to be more precise, so this is mostly the work of uh, Daniel Woodke, which is a PhD student in our lab, and a few people in our lab, but all of the experiments uh, were done by Fusheng Tang in Arkansas. So, so they did the experiments. Um, and out of nine genes that they tested in East, uh, out of nine mutants, eight of them disrupted uh, caloric restriction mediated life extension, including three of them that extend lifespan in ad libitum conditions by reducing under caloric restriction, so what we call caloric restriction mimetics. So what you see here on the right is an example of that. Um, so you have wild type, um, and as you can see, when you put wild type under dietary restriction, it extends lifespan. Um, but then you have these mutants, uh, RCR2, um, and if you the mutant under normal conditions is actually long-lived. Um, so, I mean, in, in East, you measure, you count the number of generations. Um, and as you can see, that increases in the mutant under normal conditions. But when you put this mutant under caloric restriction, it actually decreases as compared to well-type, the, the number of its lifespan. 
Um, so what this shows again is that we can use our network-based methods to identify and rank new candidates, in this case, to study caloric restriction. Um, well, we haven't looked that much into the functions of the new genes, and they appear to be related to vacuolar functions, but uh, I mean, that, that's something our collaborators in the US are more interested in, so it's not something we are uh, studying here. Now, the other thing also, still in the context of caloric restriction, um, relates to the surprising memory effects of lipoic acid. And, and so this was something that was discovered by uh, Brian Mary and colleagues. So Brian um, used to be in Liverpool, but uh, since retired. Um, and what essentially what he found was that lipoic acid can induce a memory effect um, of dietary restriction. I'll, I'll show you. It's, it's easier. So normally, so you can have mice fed ad libitum. Um, and they don't live longer, and you can have mice uh, under caloric restriction, um, which have an extended lifespan. But you can also switch them around. You can have young mice under ad libitum, and then put them on caloric restriction, and these still live longer. And conversely, you can have mice uh, fed caloric, uh, under caloric restriction, then switch to ad libitum in middle age, and these don't have, don't live longer than controls. Um, now, what Brian found that was surprising was that lipoic acid induces a memory effect. So if you add lipoic acid to the equation, essentially what happens is that the ad libitum fed mice, as young, um, if they're also fed lipoic acid, even if they're switched to caloric restriction, they actually don't live longer anymore, even though they gain weight. Uh, I'm sorry, even though uh, weight is affected. Um, and conversely, in uh, caloric restriction, um, animals that are then switched to ad libitum, uh, here again, even if they do gain weight, um, if lipoic acid is also supplemented, then they do live longer. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very surprising, and I think, striking phenomena um, that we really can't explain. Uh, and so we've been trying to study it. Um, and in particular, we've been studying using um, gene expression profiling using um, RNA sex, so sequencing the transcriptome. Um, and we're still doing this analysis, but I'll show you a little bit of what we've done. So essentially, so we sequence a transcriptome. You extract RNA, you chop it in pieces, and you sequence, and then you map it to a reference genome, and this allows you to quantify gene expression levels. And we've done this in the brain of rats, um, using the samples from Brian Mary. Um, we did it first for aging. Um, we found a number of genes differentially expressed with age, things related to immune system, neurotransmitter, things you would expect. Um, one thing I thought was interesting um, was that there were a number of what we call dark matter transcripts. These are transcripts that don't map to known exons um, that were differentially expressed um, with age. So this is just normal aging, um, which is more, so we found 37, which is more than you'd expect by chance, um, based on the results from uh, um, protein coding genes. Um, on one hand, it's actually quite interesting because we're seeing these transcripts that um, we know very little about that change with age that may be important. Um, on the other hand, it's a bit frustrating because we have no idea what most of them do. Uh, so it goes back to my point earlier, how we need a better understanding of the genome um, to understand aging and to understand um, human biology. Um, we've also done, more recently, we've done RNA stack of the different conditions from Brian, so the uh, caloric restriction switches with and without lipoic acid. Um, there were a number of what we call longevity associated genes, that is, genes that have higher levels of expression um, or they're differentially expressed in the mouse cohorts that have a longer lifespan um, because of the switches. Um, genes related to the mitochondria, respiratory chain, etc. Um, one of the things that was interesting was that there were a number of chromatin modifying genes, and histone is still transferases, um, which suggests some epigenetic mechanisms is at play here. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's really what we want to do next. And I mean, we just applied for, for a grant to do uh, epigenetics um, on these rats. Um, the other thing that we found was that, so if you look at just the signatures of caloric restriction and lipoic acid, there are some shared signatures. And... Uh, more, there's a number of genes that suggest neuroprotective effects, um, which, which seems quite interesting because there, there is some evidence that both caloric restriction and lipoic acid do have neuroprotective effects. So some of the genes we're finding do fit that bill. Um, we also looked at microRNAs across all the different conditions. Um, and again, there were some microRNAs that could be involved in neuroprotection. 
Um, do again, microRNAs have the problem that we know very little about them. So what we're actually doing now is we're, we've got um, culture of brain cell lines, um, and we hope to test some of these microRNAs. So manipulate them in cell lines and see um, what, what exactly we observe, if they have neuroprotective functions or not. So that's, that's what we now aim to do. Now, the, the last thing I'll mention on caloric restriction is kind of a side note, really, is that because we're playing with all of these gene expression signals of caloric restriction, um, we thought, well, as I'm sure you're aware, there's large-scale drug databases um, with gene expression signatures. So we thought, can we find drugs that induce the same signatures of caloric restriction? And that's fairly very easy to do computationally. Um, so we gave it a shot. I wasn't, didn't have very high hopes for it, to be honest. But I was very surprised, and over a thousand genes, I'm sorry, over a thousand drugs tested, the top drug was rapamycin, which extends lifespan in mice. Some people argue via caloric restriction related pathways. Um, so I thought, well, that's not an accident, so that there may be some biologically relevant results here. Um, and so what we're doing now, we're trying to follow up on these results in worms, essentially using a, a, a mutant called EAT2. So uh, this is a genetic model of caloric restriction. Essentially, they have a, a defect in their larynx, and they cannot eat as much. So they physically, they physically cannot eat as much. They live longer, and we've observed that. Um, and so what we're doing now is we're feeding the drugs to both controls and to controls and to eat two mutants, see if the drugs extend lifespan in normal conditions um, and also under caloric restriction conditions, uh, seeing if there's a synergistic effect or not with caloric restriction. Um, and if there isn't, maybe... Possibly they're working through the same pathways. <laughs> so now in the final few minutes um, of my talk, I completely changing topics. Um, and I just want to say a few words about another aspect of aging that I've been fascinated for many years, which is the biodiversity of aging. Um, so I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure you're aware that different animals have different lifespans. So if mice typically don't live more than four years. Um, rhesus monkeys can live over 40. Um, humans can live over 100. And possibly at the other end of the spectrum is the bowhead whale, which has been estimated um, to live over 200 years. So there's this very large variation in longevity. Um, and it's not just due to the environment, because if you take a mouse and you keep it in captivity, you take care of it as bad as you can, it will still age 25, 30 times faster than a human being, no matter how well you take care of it. Um, so there has to be a genetic, genomic basis to it. Uh, and that, that's something that's always fascinated me. And it's not due to metabolic rates. Um, so I know that this theory, rate of living theory, that species with higher metabolic rates are going to accumulate damage faster and going to age faster. I mean, we and, and others have shown that's not true. Actually, metabolic rates in mammals do not correlate with longevity. So there must be other mechanisms involved. Um, and so, I mean, this is something that a lot of people have um, thought about. There's a number of theories again. Um, I think Aristotle was one of the first to, to consider it. Um, question, why are some animals long-lived and others short-lived? Um, and we still don't know, uh, unfortunately. There really is no established explanation. I mean, Aristotle, I think his theory was that moist was important. Um, so I, I think it may have to do with the fact that fruit, when it decays, it loses moist. So his argument was that animals that live longer are going to have more moist um, than animals that have short lifespans, which, well, it hasn't really catched on. Um, so we don't really know why some animals are short-lived and others long-lived. Um, so what we've been trying to do, on one hand, we've been focusing on this fascinating and, and beautiful animal called the naked mole rat. Um, the reason we're interested in it is because, first, is because it's the longest-lived rodent, so they can live over 30 years. So these are relatively small animals. They're, they're a little bit bigger than a mouse. They're smaller than a rat. Um, and I think more than their longevity is the fact that they appear to be extremely cancer-resistant. So in hundreds of, of animals, cancer has not been observed. I mean, maybe it will be observed one day, but at the very least, they're extremely resistant to cancer. Um, so back when I was in Boston, we put in a genome sequencing proposal uh, to the NIH, which uh, sadly was unsuccessful, but since then um, the BGI has sequenced the genome, and so we now have a, a number of molecular tools, really, to study these animals. Um, so what I'm trying to do is we're trying to understand the genetic and molecular mechanisms of the longevity and cancer resistance of the naked mole rat in comparison to other rodents, like mice and rats, that typically do not live more than four years. Um, 
And uh, again, very briefly, I mean, we've done a gene expression comparison between naked mole rat and, and, um, and mice using liver samples from young animals. Um, we found a, a number of genes related to um, overexpressed in the naked mole rat compared to mice, related to the mitochondria and related to oxidation reduction. Um, I mean, of course, this could be related to other physiological differences between mice and naked mole rats. It's always hard to say. Um, but what we show is that we can do RNA-seq. So this was done with RNA-seq, with transcriptome sequencing. We can do it in, in naked mole rats. We can use it to compare it to mice. Um, though, of course, while we identify some genes, I mean, we still have to figure out if they're really important or not. One of the projects that we, we started um, a couple of years ago already, um, with a number of collaborators, including uh, my, my former postdoc mentor, George Church, was to get some naked mole rat genes and put them in mice. So we, we cloned some cancer and aging related genes, like P53, from naked mole rats. Um, and the idea is that you replace, for example, P53, you replace the mouse P53 by the naked mole rat P53. And you see if that has an effect on cancer or on aging. Ideally, it would have. Um, though it's very, very hard to predict what's going to happen. Um, and so this is, well, currently being done with uh, David Harrison at the Jackson Lab. Um, so they've been working on this for, for some time. And hopefully, um, later this year, we will have this knock-in mice with naked mole rat genes. Um, and the, I guess the last thing I will mention is a, a more recent project also of our lab, which is the, the bowhead whale. Um, so the bowhead whale has been estimated. They use this, they use this indirect method. It's a biochemical method. Um, they look at the racemization ratios in the eye lenses uh, of whales, um, and they use this to estimate the, the longevity, how, long, how, how old they are. And so bowheads have been estimated to live over 200 years. I, I don't know if that's true or not. I am convinced, however, that they live longer than human beings. That, that I'm sure. There's evidence from other whales as well. Um, and if you think about it, these are massive animals. They're the second biggest animal in the world after the blue whale. Um, so they must be very cancer resistant. Because if, if you think about it, if cancer derives from a single you know, rogue cell, then animals, massive animals like the bowhead, they must have a very, very smaller, each of their cells must have a very much smaller probability of developing cancer than human cells, or they would have died of cancer long ago. They, they wouldn't live as long. Um, so we're interested in these animals because they live so long and because for sure they must have tumor suppressive mechanisms. Um, and so we've, we recently started to sequence the, the genome of the bowhead whale. Um, and again, we hope to have that finished later this year and hope it will be a, a, a resource for understanding the longevity and, and disease resistance of, this, of these amazing animals. Um, so in summary, I've told you that aging remains a mystery of biology, which has this massive impact on society and medicine, um, which also, but it's also an opportunity because if we can manipulate it, then it would have uh, unparalleled health benefits. Um, I'll tell you a bit about databases. We have this database of aging-related genes, um, which can also be employed for a variety of systems biology analysis. And I'll tell you about how network-based analysis can lead to new insights. Um, I'll tell you about our RNA-seq analysis of aging in rats, um, which reveals these changes or in dark matter of the genome. Um, and, and one aspect that, that I think is quite important is that we, we do have this challenge now of integrating data from different types, of integrating multidimensional data, which I do think is a, going to be one of the major challenges now, because you have transcriptomic data, you have interactomic data, proteomic, et cetera. You want to integrate it to try to understand the system, in this case, to try to understand aging um, or, or, or any other disease. Um, and lastly, I told you about uh, our work on long-lived species to find genes that protect against aging and age-related diseases. Um, so thank you very much. I mean, these are the, the people in our, our group who, who did um, most of this work together with our collaborators around the world. Um, and of course, uh, thank you to our funding sources to, for essentially paying for most of what I talked about today. So thank you very much for your time and attention.